it's great to see you all here today. Um, let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer over the word today. Heavenly Father, let this word be fruitful, Lord, in the hearts of your people. Let it be honest. Let it not be prideful. Let it touch the hearts that need to hear it, my Heavenly Father. It is a testimony, Lord, of what you have done for me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, you know, when we all hear Malachi, we all say, mm, you know, it's coming. It's coming. Okay? <laughs> so, let me read from Malachi 3.10 to 11 to you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there might be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that your hands will not be able to hold them. I will rebuke the devourer for you. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. And the vines in your fields will not rub their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever wondered why is it so hard to take God at his word? Could it be because we believe in God, but we don't always believe the word of God? Especially when we're confronting our own limitations. When we think that what we're asking is so big. And we look at it through our eyes. And we forget that the one that we're praying to can do the impossible. Oddly enough, very but very seldom do I hear a brother or a sister in Christ quote this verse and admit that this is what they give. To some, to challenge God might appear as an act of defiance, but it's not. We are not tempting our God. We are just standing on his word, on his promise. We are simply saying, God, I do trust you. I will bring to the storehouse my first fruit, not my leftover. I will trust you to provide for all my needs. My social security check, my pension, my investment fund, my paycheck to paycheck budget. I will trust that you will keep the devourer from my family and that my fruit will not fall before its time. I will not be in want because God, you are my provider. Today I thought that rather than a sermon, I would like to share with you what has happened to me since I took God into my heart and my mind and trusted that he meant what he said. Given is personal. No one can make anyone give. We are not meant to be guilt into giving, and I will not do that. I will tell you the church needs your support, I will tell you that heaven will not be denied to you because you don't give. God will love you. Jesus will love you until the very end of your life and beyond, whether you give or not. But, should I li I, but I would like to tell you why I give my own personal testimony. I was saved by grace 22 years ago, and I have been tithing faithfully for 21. I remember my pastor saying tithing was a way of telling God that we trusted him to provide. I remember reading repeatedly in 2 Corinthians 9 and 8, and God can make all grace abound to you. So that having it all, having all sufficiency, in everything, you may have it in abundance for every good deed. A good deed was feeding my kids, <laughs> praying my mortgage, going to the movies every once in a while, 
and taking one of my kids on a dinner date once a month. When you have six kids, believe me, they fight for the once a month. I took this to mean, Francis, I will bless you so that you could be a blessing to others. That's what it meant for me. So I took a step in faith and I started tithing 10%, sometimes more, sometimes less. When you live paycheck to paycheck, it is not easy to meet all your um, children needs all at once. They all seem to need choose all at once and paying your mortgage at the same time. Life sometimes can be a little bit complicated. But my trust is all I had to give to God. Trust was and is my treasure. And it only belongs to Him. So let me tell you how things started going down after I started tithing. Picture one. That's my daughter, Mari. Mari, she is my third daughter. Smart, beautiful, the quietest of the six. She, patch, she uh, packs a mean punch. After being married for a few months, she became pregnant. We were all so excited. She was 21 weeks when labor started. Picture two. This is TJ. He, I would put him, and he was this big. Weighed almost nothing. He was born the 25th of November at 2 pounds, 4 ounces. He went from labor and delivery directly to the DQ. That is him on the screen. His skin was so thin that we could see his veins and little lines and what we thought were his organs and everything. Um, and picture three, that is him now. <laughs> God was good. He was picked for varsity. He plays linebacker. <laughs> He's 15 years old now, and he is a great and wonderful student, and he's a great human being. God was faithful. I had received a blessing so large, my heart's were not able to hold it. And the devourer had been kept away. Picture three. That is my do oldest daughter, Eloisa. She's pretty. <laughs> and she thinks she's pretty too. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, they all fight for that title. Being the only child and being the previous one. My oldest daughter, Eloisa, goes for a checkup. She was 33 years old. And the doctor told her, the doctor told her she needed a complete hysterectomy. Everything was set up, and after the surgery, we were told that there was a tumor in her kidney, and it needed to be t taken a look at immediately. That night, I made an appointment at the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix. I had no problem doing this. God opened all the doors for her. If the cancer had spread, we were in for the fight of her life. After the surgery, the doctor came to me and her husband and said, she did fine. We took her kidney out and the cancer was encapsulated. No farther treatment will be needed. This was 11 years ago. She continues to be cancer-free. God was good. I had received a blessing so large. My hands were not able to hold it. And he had rebuked the devourer. Picture number five. <sighs> this is my trouble child. <laughs> and Helica, you will know why. <laughs> Shortly... Um, 
After that, my daughter Angelica and her now husband decided to go kayaking in the Gila River in New Mexico. <laughs> they left on a Friday to come back Saturday night. I knew Saturday night that something was wrong, but I couldn't figure what it was. There was just as an unsettling, I just couldn't put my finger on it. But there was a, 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 a restlessness inside of me. But I could not say what it was. By Sunday evening, I had called the New Mexico Park Rangers office. And the search and rescue office that night found the car, but no trace of them. Alton, the now husband, was army. So on Monday morning, I called Fort Bliss. We were all stationed in El Paso to report them missing. They immediately got working on it. We were running into the Texas can come into New Mexico unless New Mexico invites you. <laughs> Time was passing by and New Mexico was just taking long to get the whole thing together. At that time is when I find out that the search and rescue in New Mexico is all made of volunteers and they have their jobs. So even if they had to leave right now, there is a process of time where you cannot get them all together. And if you get two or three, well, that's not going to be enough because everybody has their own job that they do. I knew something was wrong. I had no peace. And my children and I were preparing to head out that day. I kept the severity of this from my husband he was already extremely sick. He died three weeks later. The temperature dropped Monday night to 17. Tuesday morning, the Army called me and said, we are going in. This is an Army search and rescue operation now. They sent two Black Hawks and they found them. When I met them at the hospital that night, they were bruised and scratched but alive. And my son-in-law <laughs> was wondering, why did they send two Blackhawks to, to get us? Like, huh? You know, like, <laughs> he just couldn't believe it. My daughter told me she kept praying, Lord, do not give my mom peace. As long as she doesn't have peace, she will be looking for me. <laughs> and I was. <laughs> and God was good. One more time, my hands was not able to hold what he had promised, and he had kept the devourer from my children. Picture five. This is Gladys. She is the number two right after Eloisa. Then Gladys, on the screen, she was a diabetic since she was 10 years old. Her kidneys had given out, and she was on the list for a transplant. I remember praying, Lord, if you're going to take her, don't let me see it happen. Take me first so that I can be waiting for her. I knew that I just could not over, I, know I could not deal with her leaving and me staying behind. Well, we got a call on Monday at 11 o'clock. The transplant team had found a match in Hawaii. Time was everything. An organ only has a viable span of six hours before it starts to deteriorate. We drove to the Mayo Clinic that night and arrived at 6.50 in the morning. Surgery was scheduled for 7 a.m. We got there, parked, walked into the ER, and they put her on the gurney right there where you see her. <laughs> and that's her being wheeled in. Several hours later, the doctor comes out and tells me everything went fine. She was a perfect match. The kidney started to work instantly, and the pancreas turned pink immediately. I said, the what? He said, the pancreas, C4, 
See, there was only supposed to be one kidney. Having the pancreas made, she will no longer be a diabetic. Seldom, but very seldom, do they transplant two organs into the same person. She had no complications, no organ rejections. We stayed at the Mayo Clinic for six weeks. People will ask her after she came home if she was not afraid. You know, a big surgery and, and all that, you know, what's happening, the pain and everything. And she told them, my mama told me that she had peace about this. So it was okay with me. That's why you see her <coughs> going to all of us and the nurses were saying, you know, what do you do? <laughs> Picture seven. That's her getting married. That's me officiating the service. I cannot tell you what it meant. The picture on the day of her wedding was two years ago, and I officiated. God was right. He said, trust me and see if I will not provide for you above and beyond your greatest needs, your greatest hope. I had received a blessing so large, my hands were not able to hold it, and the devourer had been rebuked. This last picture, those are my four girls and, and, and the baby boy. Mm -hmm. um, I have six children, two boys and four girls. The other boy lives, uh, has a very hard life. He is a dad chef, and he lives in French St. Martin. He just, he tells me all the time, well, I have, somebody has to take one for the team, mom. <laughs> he comes down two times a year, you know, and, and he loves it over there, and he sends us picture of all the things that he does, and uh, it's the life he has chosen, and, and I believe he has been blessed because it is what he wanted to do. Now, here, uh, you see them all, you know, how much they love him and everything. You know, they're all grown. And take the, la the next picture. <laughs> this is how they really feel about him. <laughs> they always call him a mama's boy. They will call him a mama's boy when he was very young and he would get upset. As he was growing up and, and passing the teenage years, one day he said, you know, I don't care if you call me a mama's boy. I am a mama's boy, and I'm very proud of being a mama's boy. And that's when that started. It was okay until he didn't like to be called a mama's boy. Then, then after that, it got physical. <laughs> Once again, God had blessed me beyond what I could handle in my hands and he had rebuked the devourer in conclusion did the blessing come because I tithe or because I trusted God we cannot buy salvation we cannot buy his favor either I believe I really did nothing except obey he said, bring your tithing to the storehouse. Try me and see. I took him at his word because I trusted him. And then I navigated on that until now. I trust and obey. I bring my sacrificial gift to the storehouse. That is our church. So that there will be food in God's house. And we can serve the needy, the lost, the own church, and the brokenhearted and the hopeless. Today is our opportunity to do just that, to bring our gift into the storehouse. To those who much is given, much is expected, but only if you can give generously, sacrificially, and joyfully. Pray about your gift to God. This is a covenant between you and him no one else. Receive 
this word as a nugget of wisdom for you today. It is not equal giving, but it is always equal sacrifice. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for the anointed Jesus, our Lord and our high priest, your son, our savior, our healer, our provider. He is the apostle of our faith, the high priest of our confession. And it is in him, Father, that we lift our tithe to you. Lord, we thank you for all you have given for us so many blessings, Lord, that we cannot begin to count them. They're without number. For making us stewards of your gifts, we thank you. Lord, we pray that you will develop in us a giving heart that glorifies you with our giving, a shield for heart that desires to give lavishly to your kingdom. I ask you, you will give us wisdom to know what to give, knowing that all things come from you. And it is from the overabundance of your blessing that we are being given back. Give us, I pray, a giving heart, a generous heart, a grateful heart. Develop in us a heart that is filled with thanks and praise to you. For all that we have is yours, and you are the one that I treasure the most. In Jesus' name, as I thank him, amen. Thank you.